Beneath the tranquility of this little prairie town and in other little towns across the Dakotas, for the past 70 years, there has remained a terrible secret. It was in a Wisha cafe that my relative Leon handed me a barely legible Xerox of an old letter that he kept in his billfold. Reading the letter that day in the cafe, I realized from its intimate tone that immigration had not severed ties with those left behind in Ukraine, as those of us in later generations in America had assumed. It was that letter, and hundreds like it, sent to the Dakotas in the 1930s that led me on a journey of discovery down the blood-dark corridors of my own ethnic history. Dear brother, I take up a pencil to write you a few lines. We ask all our dear friends to help so that we don't die of hunger. Send this letter to your newspaper so that the entire world can see what is being done to us. A century ago, several hundred thousand ethnic Germans, including my own relatives, immigrated from Tsarist Ukraine to America. In less than a decade, these German-speaking farmers transformed the ocean of Dakota grassland into the world's largest wheat-producing area. The price was high. The wind never seemed to cease, nor did the epidemics that swept away their children nor did the backbreaking labor of pioneering on America's prairie frontier. When spring crocuses bloomed, reminiscent of the flowers on the steppe, their hearts ached with heimweh, homesickness. And it was hardest on the women, especially the women who yearned for the prosperous villages of their youth in Ukraine. They said sometimes they cried and cried if they could just go back again. And one day they said, I cried so much I thought heaven was split. Only one in four of this German minority came to the Americas. And as letters arrived with news of one grim event after another in their old homeland of Ukraine, those on the prairie, despite their own sufferings, realized they were the lucky ones. I want to let you know that I, your sister, along with your parents, are still in Ukraine. Oh, I dare not think of former times, how good we lived, but things have changed. When you left here, we thought you were the dumbest person alive. This is the old city hall in my hometown of Wishick, North Dakota. In the basement of this building was the town newspaper. It was a bilingual newspaper. It was printed in both German and English versions. And in the late 1920s and early 1930s, the farmers from the surrounding areas would bring their letters that they got from Ukraine and would have them reprinted here so that a wider audience could learn about the situation in the old homeland. Dear editor, I am sending your newspaper two letters, please, for both of them. Don't mention the names of my family here or in the old country, because even here in the United States, there are members of the secret police and spies. Two years ago in Ukraine, they shot my brother, and another brother of mine was banished to Siberia. Across the Dakotas, in homesteads around rural churches like this one, St. Andrews, the old pioneers would gather after the services and discuss the letters that they'd received from the old country. They spoke often of the sorrow letters, as the messages came to be called, and despite the farm foreclosures of the Great Depression and the failed crops and the drought and the grasshoppers, many Dakota pioneers sent generous financial and emotional aid to their home villages in Soviet Ukraine. In your last letter, you say that when you come together there, you still talk about us here. It is the same with us too. You Americans are already in heaven you just don't know it yet. Our beloved friends, we thank you for your rich gifts. Each time the mail comes, the children 
of each family line up to receive letters and packages. This is the old neighborhood where I grew up. And as I was translating letters that were written from Ukraine to Dakota, I was surprised to find that many of the letter writers had the same last names as those of the people in my own hometown. I could almost hear the writers' voices as I translated the letters, for they were written in the German dialect of my grandparents, with the same cadences and rhythms and phrases from my childhood, as they described the fate the Dakotans so narrowly escaped. After you left here, the communists began to come in 1919 and begin to levy taxes, and little by little, we lost what we had built up. In 1929, collectivizing began, when we were forced to give up all our land and property. So we all lost all we had, except for our lives. And many others lost even that when they were named as kulaks, as enemies of the regime and deprived of their rights. They had a very affluent life. It, they had uh, German schools, they had German church, and uh, they had very uh, free, they were pretty free in, in, until the Bolsheviks took over and then of course everything went downhill. On my travels to Ukraine, I spoke with aging survivors, like my grandmother's cousin, who still remembers the money, the packages that arrived 70 years ago, and even the contents of semolina and rice. A great gift from Uncle Johan in America has arrived. He sent us $15. I felt such joy that I wept loudly and thanked the dear God for answering our prayers. You have saved me and my family from a certain debt. Admonish our other brother there in America who doesn't want to hear our woes. Tell him to send us the swill that his pigs won't eat. If they would collect all the tears we shed that time, there would be hundreds and thousands of gallons tears, just tears. Stalin's five-year plan imposed the collective system upon the rural economy of Ukraine. Villages came under the control of communist activists, Stalin's shock troops, often from other countries, whose purpose, in accord with Marxist philosophy, was to create class warfare and liquidate the wealthy class, the kulaks. The term kulak became applicable to anyone suspect, especially the small landholders of Ukraine, self-reliant peasantry like the ethnic Germans, whose religion, prosperity, and opposition to collectivization branded them a hated minority. Similar to how the Nazis dehumanized the Jewish people, the communists labeled ethnic Germans and Ukrainian villagers as vermin, as bloodsuckers, as parasites, and as kulak dogs. When I was uh, a little girl, my mother had me in the little wagon pulling between Nidorf and Klikstal. Another communist met her on the road and she was pregnant with my younger brother. This was in 34. He said, uh, if you weren't pregnant and if you didn't have this breath with you, I'd shoot you right now. He would have shot her right there on the road because they came from a, a rich family. When I got your letter, dear nephew, I had to weep and cry for joy that you have not forgotten us. We cannot write about everything happening here. I am sick of this world, sick of it all, fed up. The squad of men who oversee us with guns in their pockets are the only law. Oh, it is a hard life in this world. I am glad you've survived so well. Whoever doesn't want to join the collective is named an enemy of the state, and then with extreme cruelty mistreated. People's homes are raided at night. To finance a hasty industrial and military buildup, and to bolster strategic grain reserves against real and perceived enemies, Soviet central planning demanded huge quotas of grain from its collectives, of timber from its interior ministry, and of humans for slave labor and then extermination as bourgeois enemies in northern labor camps. 1931 started. They came around the house at night, and then they searched the house. They searched for food. They searched if we were hiding someplace. And everybody was ready. You 
all the pants you own, you put one on top of each other in the shirts because most of the time, most of the time when they come in and kick you out of the house, you didn't get a chance to go back no more. See. The secret police collected their victims at night and always in the fall to not disrupt the harvest. Forced into wagons in order to bring their saws and hatchets, villagers shouted hurried goodbyes to those lucky enough to remain. We had heard that they were gonna take the men that they had gotten together that night. Uh, then on, at a certain time over to the Bahnhof, to the train station, and uh, that they were gonna move them. So mom packed a little, uh, like a suitcase, it was a wooden little suitcase with a set of clothes in there for him and maybe a little piece of the ham and stuff to put in to take along. And I remember how they took him. It was a lot of guys walking. And I was running on the side because mom couldn't go near when I was running along on the side next to dad and handed it over to dad. And then we walked for a while and he said I should turn around and go home. In the night, people were awakened, then forced into the street and loaded into sleds in 38 degrees of frost. All were driven into the forest. Hundreds of sleds passed by us, all loaded with people. Many froze to death. Viele sind verfroren. My uh, grandma's brother, I, I remember that real well. He was taken away. Uh, Gottlieb Sauer, and he, uh, they let him free, and then he was, oh, for years he was in hiding. And I remember one night he was under our bed, and nobody, I mean, mom and dad knew it, but I, I didn't know it. And he was kind of moving around a little bit under the bed, you know how low the beds are? He was hiding under the end. We were looking and listening, what is it? And then mom told us, don't say anything, it's Uncle Gottlieb. In September, the arrests began. At night, midnight, a knock on the window. The door isn't opened, for it is well known who is outside. Then the windows are knocked in and the militia climb into the room. The farmer and his wife are arrested, sent away. The children sit naked and hungry. Uh, outside, when in the morning they had to bring the horse back and put their family, and there the railroad says she took the parents and put in this fresh car, no seed, nothing, in like animals. When the children they let there, the light it was a clip their hair and turned down crying, separating the children. I remember they bring the children with the wagon back and bring it in the church and send it all around. And then the relative and friend come and take from these children and raise them. We were 40 persons crammed into a cattle car and locked for our full nine day journey to Siberia. The air was so foul, we almost smothered. We were unloaded into the snow, sick, old, baby screaming and crying. If no help comes, we are a lost people, forgotten by all but God. I hope to see you again, if not here, in the other world, heaven. They didn't shut many people. They take them to Siberia and they make them to work until they die because they didn't feed them. During collectivization, millions were sent to a massive system of northern camps, like the dreaded Solovetsky Islands in the White Sea, where prisoners, known as White Coal for their expendability, were greeted with a sign which read, with an iron fist, lead humanity to happiness. One in 10 survived. We are held in darkness here in the Nord. Please, if this letter comes into your hand, publish it. Many of our Germans have been sent here, where life is short. 
many frees. They don't treat us as humans. Our misery and sorrow scream to the heavens. I still remember the old German songs from my childhood in this church. And now I know that in those melodic and mournful strains, the aging Dakota parishioners grieved for their relatives who'd been executed, starved, or worked to death in Ukraine. Songs they'd once sung together in their old homeland. Oh, how many letters I write to you in my thoughts while working in the forests, and how many beautiful songs I sing to you. I'm standing near the tombstone of Christian Stuck in the Lutheran Cemetery just outside of Wishick, North Dakota. And Christian Stuck was a farmer and he lived just a couple miles to the north here. In the 1920s and 1930s, he exchanged a series of letters with his sister, Christina Flemmer, who lived in Gleekstall, Ukraine. She wrote that at night they sneaked into the closed church through the rear entrance, and in the darkness they knelt and prayed for death. In our village, the entire harvest had to be given up to the regime. The terrible hunger has driven people out of their minds, and many are killing themselves by hanging. When one of Chris Stuck's neighbors, Johannes Diegel, sent a letter to Ukraine in 1934, the recipient of that letter was arrested and shot by the secret police. It was a terrible quandary for the Dakotans. Send letters and money and risk the execution or exile of their loved ones, or sever contact and hope that their relatives and friends would somehow survive. Some families to outwit the Soviet censors wrote in code, saying the exact opposite of what they meant. Others ceased writing. Death is always before our eyes. The authorities have sent 150 men to our village, whose job it is to plague and work us to death. Several times the collective leaders have gathered us all together and told us the following. Now you will see that wherever you insects have settled in Russia, we have you in our hands. No God will help you, no matter how hard you pray, no one will hear your cries. There will be hangings, shootings, freezing to death and starvation, all if you can't meet the demands of the five-year plan. Children say there is no reason to live. I am now 60 years old now, just a worn out pilgrim here in the Valley of Tears. There were stores of potatoes buried in the ground during autumn as provisions for spring, but people were commanded to uncover them in February. That command cost many people their lives. After the potatoes were lost that way, there was an uprising. When a Red Army division was sent at the beginning of March, they found such a terrible situation in the village that they divided their provisions with the people. Now, no more Red Army units are sent to places of unrest. They only send communists who get their rations from the secret police. From 1930 until well past mid-decade, collectivization brought hunger, extreme poverty, and massive mortality rates, peaking in 1933 with the greatest demographic disaster to hit European peasantry since the Middle Ages. That year, Brigades of communist activists, called the Iron Broom, swept through the villages house by house, removing all food as payment in kind under Soviet law because Ukraine had not met the regime's inflated grain quotas. The regime's henchmen search for grain and go so far as to dig up the earth and to demolish the ovens in the homes. To look even there, hidden or not hidden, all food is taken away. The children are continuously hungry. My little Alex, he cries and demands something to eat. I can't even give him a glass of milk. Lulled by false reports denying widespread starvation in Ukraine filed by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Walter Durante in the New York Times, an award never rescinded, the United States granted official recognition to the Soviet Union in 1933, 
the same year, a fully informed Stalin allowed starvation to punish and depopulate areas most resistant to collectivization. There were food shortages across the Soviet Union, but nothing compared to the Ukraine, the Caucasus, the Lower Volga, and portions of Kazakhstan and Siberia. A vast death camp presided over by well-fed communist officials and security police cadres. It was the apocalyptic nightmare that the religious villagers had both feared and predicted. The Holodomor, the hunger torment. By us, the harvest was good, even very good. And still, we have no food or bread. For the regime has taken it all. We are already swelling from hunger and can no longer help ourselves. I'm shaking now from hunger like a hundred-year-old man. My feet are already swollen. People are so weak, they fall over. You can't imagine how it is here. People fall over like flies. Here there reigns a terrible hunger, 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 and again hunger. We eat the rotten flesh of dead horses. Every day there are burials. Mankind is like flowers in the grass. After I butcher our cat, that is the last of our food. Even now, three quarters of a century later, remnants of the trauma of collectivization can still be found in the former German villages in Ukraine. In the churches whose steeples were removed in an attempt to erase religious belief, in the long collective barns where German tombstones were used in the foundations, and in the roof beams called blood and hunger wood that came from forced labor in northern camps. And it was beams like these exported to the west that sometimes had a severed finger bound to the logs along with these words, if only you knew the human cost to produce this lumber. In Hofnungstal, Ukraine, now Sebrikova, villagers showed my son and I the long barns where on the night of December 17, 1937, the regime's death squads imprisoned 300 local men, torturing them into false confessions before execution. It was a microcosm of Stalin's great terror when purges against the party leadership and the Soviet army and against traditional enemies like the ethnic German minority and the Ukrainian national movement resulted in three quarters of a million executions, 1,500 murders for every day between August 1937 and November 1938. I remember Grandpa uh, was taken away and uh, the night before he was taken away that will always stay with me. We were there and he said to me, I should give him a hug and a kiss and I didn't do it. And I will never ever forget that. And then that night they came and picked him up and then they executed him. And you know how kids are. But I said, no, like my grandson does now. <laughs> The next year, in 1938, the German villagers were finally allowed a share of a huge bumper crop. And those who'd survived the decade-long odyssey of hunger and terror, unable to digest such substantial fare, died by the hundreds in some villages. A final and ironic death toll from too much bread, not too little. The harvest was so great, so good, they, they didn't have enough uh, machinery to even to harvest it in time. It's just like here, people feed the birds, you know, and they eat too much and it swelled up and then it kills them. That's what the same was that time, you know, that new bread came and the people eat, you know, and eat too much and it just kills them. The sorrow letters contributed to making the Central Dakotas still home to descendants of Germans from Ukraine, one of the most consistently conservative voting blocs in the United States. The Dakota pioneers, wary of the spread of communism, kept a low profile politically and rarely spoke of the letters or the tragic fate of their relatives in Ukraine 
even to their rapidly assimilating offspring. In 2002, the President of Ukraine ordered a national memorial built to the victims of the Soviet repression and to victims of the Holodomor, the hunger torment, which the next year was declared an act of genocide and a deliberate terrorist act. None of the communist officials who orchestrated and presided over this human rights disaster, which killed almost a quarter of Ukraine's population, have ever been called to justice. For me, one of the most moving letters was from one of my relatives, Catherine Boji, in Kassel, Ukraine, and she was writing to her sister in 1934, Barbara Schnabel Kramer. Oh, you dear loved ones, if only I could come to your home for the midday meal. Surely you would have potatoes and bread. I dream of you so often. We must endure much to enter God's kingdom. If I survive, I don't know. Wilted roses fall to the ground. I'll love you to the grave. There is much to tell, but the human understanding is too narrow to grasp what we've suffered. Only we know that but we must remain silent until the sun shines on our own people once again. We are vertrieben and Soviet Deutschen since a stride from Heimatland wo eins lebt in unseren Vater wo auf unsere Wiege stand und am fremde Ort vertrieben Weiter fern von Heimatland, nur noch unsere Lieder blieben, die als Kinder wir gekannt. 